what's up, everybody? It's Mr. Talk Box. Check it out. You need to like, subscribe, and catch a YouTube family and YouTube world, I am back. I hope everyone is well and blessed, like I always say. I mean it, I mean it, I mean it with every inch of my heart. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, uh, before we get started, please, please, please go like, subscribe, uh, share the page, tell people about it, especially if you kind of dig what's, what's happening over here and hanging out with me. And today, I'm going to tell you all something. Today, um, I have a very, very super special guest with me. Um, I've been following this young lady for, for quite a while and um, I'm just so happy she's here and with an amazing story. Um, not only is she um, an incredible uh, musician, um, guitarist, and I, I don't even know what, we're going to get into it because she might play a whole bunch of different instruments as well. So I don't even know that part, but we're going to all find out. But she's just, a, she's just an incredible person. And I'm glad she's here, and you guys are also going to appreciate her in this interview after you um, check this out, all right? So y'all give your love and show your love and your support for my very special guest today. Y'all see her real funky right there just hanging out in the studio, hanging out with me. And trust me, she funky, y'all. I am not lying. You know, after the day, y'all going to follow her and check her out, and you're going to see that I am not lying. All right, so y'all show your love. And give your support, give a big round of applause and a standing ovation to my special, special guest, Ella Feingold. Give it up, y'all. Ella. Hey, thanks for having me. We're really happy to be here. You know, I, I'm so happy you're here. Listen, I tell everybody, I know, I know how busy you are. You know, we, we kind of been chatting and I know you're working on a few different projects. Um, but for you to take time and hang out with me for a little bit. Uh, really oh, means absolutely. really means a lot. Thanks you, thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. Thank out you for me. taking an interest. I'm, I'm, I've been looking forward to this. So, no, not as much as me. Trust me, trust me. Okay. First, first of all, how you doing? You doing all right? What's been going on? I'm doing good. Yeah, just keeping busy. You know, yeah. getting in more, fitting in, teaching, um, orchestration. Uh, I have a Patreon, so I do some teaching on there privately. Um, and kind of just enjoying the chill winter. I live in the mountains of Massachusetts, so it's okay. pretty, it's beautiful and kind of isolated, but I like it. I'm a country girl, mountain girl, so it's, it's just nice and quiet and I can just practice a lot and listen to a lot of music and not really feel like I'm being pulled in all these different directions. Got you. Understood. Uh, Understood. Well, let, let's how you doing? I'm good, man. I'm really good, especially today, and I'm I'm even better that you're here hanging out with me because oh, I can't I can't I can't wait for those who don't know you, um, but so many people know you. Um, you we, we know all some of the same people, and everybody has so much love and respect for you, uh, myself included, in this business. Um, so let's get right to it. You ready? Let's get into it. Let's get into it. <laughs> so okay, first of all, I'm gonna ask you like I asked everybody else. Where so where are you from originally? I'm from Swampscott, Massachusetts, which is the town next to Salem where the witch trials were. Wow. If you know about that crazy history in the 1600s. Just like kind of, literal, yeah, brief us on that. Brief us. I don't know anything about that. Brief us. So, you know, when they, when they used the phrase like, oh, witch hunt, it was literally like, you know, in the 1600s, there was this panic as we have throughout the history of the world, you know. The, uh, the satanic panic in the 90s, the gay panic, you know, I'm transgender, so the trans panic happening now, you know, people being afraid, which is ridiculous. Uh, so in the 1600s, they were just calling people witches. They were calling women witches as if they were, you know, possessed and casting spells on people. And their way of figuring out if someone was a witch was something like they would drown them. And if they lived, they weren't a witch. And if they didn't drown, they weren't something crazy like that wow. so there's like a really really rich history in that town and literally people come from all over the world um during the halloween season to be there just because of its history 
not really a great history, but a history, you know. So I grew up in the town next to that, and I actually got my start playing music in that town just because there were a lot of clubs before I moved to Boston. Okay, so let's let's start right there. So you you kind of got your start there. So you got your start there. So it didn't start when you were a little toddler or what? Ha or tell tell me about that. I mean, my my earliest memory of music was like being in preschool. I had this Michael Jackson book. I remember it had a red cover. It said Michael Jackson in gold letters. I think it was from around '84, and I was just fascinated, just looking in the book, looking at him and seeing him dance. And so uh, in preschool, I just used to just jump up on the desk and just try and dance like him. And I think that was really my first experience with rhythm and like just feeling music, not necessarily knowing anything about it or knowing that I would eventually do it. But I remember in preschool that that's when it started. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't actually pick up an instrument until Mm, 12 years old, maybe 13. But, you know, um, my dad, I feel like, raised me on Black American music in Motown, the OJs, the spinners, the stylistics. It was always playing in the car at home, Barry White. And I didn't really have an opinion on it. I was so young. I mean, I liked it. I remember going through a phase in the 90s when grunge was popular, you know, with like Nirvana and all that stuff. I just thought, oh, this isn't, like, it's not cool to like this music. I need to like Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains. But the truth is, the, that music was like, you know, a lullaby, kind of. And it stayed in my ears and my hands and my heart and my bloodstream, you know, my whole life. So the music that I play now, I attribute to my dad raising me on that music because that's what he grew up on, you know, and he knew all the facts and, you know, oh, with the spinners and, you know, when Felipe Wynn left and all, you know, I mean, he was just like, you know, I was like 10 or something, <laughs> just learning all this, you know, uh, music trivia. So I, I really feel like where I landed today as a musician is partly just because of what I grew up listening to. And thank goodness for that. You know, I think I would have gotten there regardless, just because of other things that happened in my life. But that really was the the seed that was planted. You know. So, when you said you you picked up an instrument, was it guitar? Was that or was it drums? Was it bass? What yeah, was it? yeah. There were some. There were some kids. Uh, there were some kids of you know my age that were playing maybe a year or two before me. Um, I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world, and. I wanted to play, but back then, you know, my my folks really didn't want me to have an instrument and make noise. I don't know if they just thought I wouldn't really stay on it, you know, and it wouldn't be a good investment or whatever. And I remember um, I did like the Jimi Hendrix thing with the broom, you know, played with the broom and stuff like that. Like I really wanted to play. And um, I would just go over to my friend's houses that had instruments and was terrible at playing, but I just wanted to hold the thing, you know what I mean? And and um, eventually, uh, like 12 or 13, I went to the city. My, my grandfather used to live in the village and he took me to um, Matt Umanov in the village. And there were like basically two starter guitars you could get. It was either like a PV Stratocaster or a Yamaha Stratocaster or something, you know, it's like a $150 guitar. So I picked the red one and I just, you know, I just had fun. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I, I, I just remember sticking with it. I remember the feeling of like, I couldn't wait to come home every day. I mean, fast forward to like high school, you know, from 13, like I just couldn't wait to get home from school or middle school and just close my eyes and just play and get lost. And to be honest with you, I think I'm still kind of chasing that feeling of when it started in the very beginning of just that purity, you know, and that, that innocence. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's how it started for me. So 15 was basically the kind of jump start to you really getting into it seriously at 15. I think so. I think, I think around then I was like, I'm never putting this thing down. Right. Ever. Right. And you know, my friends would tell me stories, 
and I know it's the same, like if, you know, Jubo and I would talk about this, but like, you know, he'd be on the toilet with the guitar. Like he yep. just didn't, I literally sleep with my guitar in my bed. No joke. <laughs> like I got one in my bed. It stays in my bed. You know, you I know, it's, have... it's funny. I'm, 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 man, I'm so sorry to cut you off. Jubu told me the <laughs> no, story, I, you know, Jubu tells me when he was little, he used to literally be on the toilet, picked up, you know, his electric guitar and the guitar was close enough to the wall and he would put the guitar on the wall and <laughs> that would be, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I'll never forget that, man. So, you know, but, but go ahead, yeah. go ahead and finish. I'm no, sorry. I was saying I still, I have a guitar in my bed. I'd rather have a, a man in my bed, but I got a guitar <laughs> and I, you know, I play every night and, um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think it was just important in the very beginning that it was just about, um, just that pure need to play. Right. Not just the want, but a need, like, I need to play this thing. Right. You know, right. eventually I kind of went through, like, I got a guitar teacher and learned some stuff. And I'll be honest with you, in the beginning, coming from playing by ear to having to learn some stuff really messed me up. And it's not the teacher's fault. I was just too young and didn't know how to digest that information. Um, and it sort of made it not fun, you know. Right, right. But I found my way back. So at 15, what were you doing? Like, were you in and out of different bands or were you playing in church or what were you doing at 15? To I did music? play in church, but much later. That was like 22, maybe. Okay. Um, I, my, my, first band, <laughs> my first band was like a Pearl Jam cover band when I was like 13. And uh, we were terrible, but we would play like school dances and stuff like that. It gave me a, a sense of identity, you know, a, a mask almost. And um, I'd say it was mostly like grunge stuff. I wasn't, I wasn't playing the Spinners or Motown and stuff like that. It was, it was grunge and having a half stack and just cranking, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that for a few years, and then um, freshman year of high school, I got into a band with college kids. So I'm what. 15 I guess and they're all in college so I joined the band and that's when it started to be you know more R&B okay. hip hop stuff like that um, and uh, yeah I mean I, I sort of missed out on a lot of teen experiences because I'd be playing like the House of Blues on a Monday night you know school night or something or on the weekend all my friends would be you know drinking at someone's house and I was in Boston playing clubs. So it was cool. It prepared me for experiences later on, but I definitely missed out on some stuff, which, you know, it, it is what it is. So at that age, then if you were doing all that, you must have been getting pretty good at this thing now, right? You find yourself getting better or where you are? Where, where yeah, you are? it just, it, yeah, it, it felt like, you know, like a language that like in the very beginning, I, I was just trying to say words and, and say phrases and by, I'd say by 15 after having played for a few years. Um, and I mean, I was inseparable with that thing. I mean, my friends tell me stories, like anytime we would call you, you always had the instrument in your hand. We'd be like, are you listening? You know, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, you know. I mean, so I, I feel like, you know how they say people put in their 10,000 hours into a craft or something? I feel like I, I put my 10,000 hours in very early on um and i'm not saying i was killing back then but i just felt comfortable to speak musically back then and for whatever reason you know those college kids wanted me to to join their band so i got a very early start to performing in live situations you know where there's like you know i couldn't drink but we're playing you know clubs so it just it taught me you know, learning music, showing up on time, what it's like to rehearse music. I just hadn't really experienced that anymore um, at that point in my life, you know. That's so, happening. That's, yeah. that's good. So did you spend um majority of, of your 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 teenage years in in, in, in Massachusetts or what, what, how, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, I, I always, I was I was in Massachusetts up until uh, 23, 
which we're going to fast forward, and, you know, we can go back. But um, uh, I went on tour with Queen Latifah. It was my first tour ever. And so I left L.A. for the I mean, I left Boston for the first time and got to, like, kind of see the country and tour around. So that was really my first time leaving Boston and had a lot of important musical things happen before that call happened to, you know, make me ready for that. So, 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 that. Is, so is that let's so let's back up just a little bit. So yeah. what, what were some of those things that happened? So the, the Queen Latifah gig, was that the start of your professional career or was did it start before that? Well it depends what you consider professional. Like to some people it's are you getting paid money to play music? That's your professional understood, career. Understood, understood, right. Or understood. or is it a, a name gig? So understood. in terms of something big happening, that Queen Latifah was the first okay. thing. But I had been playing locally, you know, playing in a wedding band. Um I was playing there's a, some friends of mine have a band named Soul Live. So I was playing um, in the sax players band. I was playing this club called Wally's Jazz Cafe. Um, but but let me give you a better timeline, which is basically that I did one year at Berklee College of Music. And the most important thing about going to that school was meeting other students from all around the world and being exposed to different music. For example, like my friend Matteo Laboriel, you know, Abe Junior, Abe Senior's, um, well, brother, son. I mean, I remember meeting him and him hipping me to voodoo, D'Angelo's voodoo, and Tony Maiden's guitar playing and Rufus, you know, just exposing me to stuff I just didn't know about because I didn't get that from my dad. Um, and kids where I grew up, which was predominantly just white middle class, they weren't to that kind of music either. You know, um, so just meeting other people, being exposed to music. I remember someone exposed me to the Mighty Clouds of Joy, and that's when I first heard Spanky. Or I remember being in an ensemble, and someone's like, "You don't know about Donny Hathaway's Everything Is Everything?" No, what's that? You know, I mean, it was just like that was the most important thing. Just being exposed to all this music that I just, you know, just ate up, and so. That led me to being able to find Spanky Alford and study with Spank. And that, I would say, that was like the first thing that, like, that man literally changed my life, you know? So um, basically, I had found a bunch of, you know, vinyl records that he had played on, like Live and Direct by the Clouds, a bunch of stuff, some random small stuff, you know, on. Actually, you're on a record with him I had with Tam. Uh, oh. Tam Tamerlin Ramsey, how do you say your name? Tamerlin, Tamerlin Ramsey, yes. Tamerlin, yeah, I remember yes. there was a record seeing your name in the mm -hmm. credits, you know, yeah. um, and Spang played on a couple. So I was just trying to find anything and everything because that way of playing guitar just, I mean, it just knocked me out, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I could talk about Spanky the whole damn time, but I'll, I'll just basically share that um we spoke on the phone, we played for each other. I think he felt how um, serious I was about it, you know? So I was in the middle of finals at Berkeley um, and he called me, he had just gotten back from New York. I think he was doing the RH Factor, the first record. And he had just gotten home and was like, hey, you know, it's around the holidays, I got a week off. Do, do you want to come to Huntsville, Alabama and play some guitar? I was like, yep. I. I dropped out of school. I didn't even finish finals. Oh yeah, never went back. You know, told my told my folks, and I work hard to get into school. I, I didn't get in at first. You know, I had to go to community college and raise my grades. And um, matter of fact, I didn't even get a high school diploma. I got a GED. Um, and uh, they were like, "You're what? You're dropping out of school after you work so hard to get in, and you're going to Alabama to play guitar with some guy named Spanky." I mean, they were just like, oh, what do you do, you know? Um, but he changed my life, you know, he picked me up and we literally played guitar for a week straight. I remember one time he just looked at me and he just smiled and he just goes, I know you're just freaking out inside right now, aren't you? 
It's like, dude, I'm dying. <laughs> like, I can't believe I get to sit here and be like, what did you play on that Tony's record? Or, you know, can you show me that bump you did with the clouds? Or, you know, and, and um, there was no gatekeeping. There was no, you know, um, he just he just shared. And, and we shit together. So it was really informative to just see how he learned music, what he listened for, what his values were. Um, and I mean, a part of the reason I am the way that I am and teach so much is because of his musical generosity. No, nobody has ever been that musically generous with me wow. other than him. And that, if there's anything about that man, aside from his gift of playing was his musical generosity to take some complete stranger, you know, and be like, Hey, come for a week. <laughs> Yeah. I'll get you a hotel room and you know motel six and or eight or whatever okay. and we just played and 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 I just had that stuff in my ears and I just kept playing and he said when you get back you need to join all black Pentecostal church and I did and I played for free for a year and um and the band was killing it was uh Charles Haynes on drums isn't if you heard of him before mm. no. Charles Killen um Keith Harris was playing organ but he plays drums with the Black Eyed Peas. So he was on organ, you know, and so I was playing with some some heavy hitters and I didn't grow up in black church. So, I mean, hearing all those passing chords fly by and all the inner motion and, and you know, I just, I just, it, that taught me how to listen and respond and and find a place inside of the music rather than on top of the music. Even if I didn't know every single chord that was going on, just finding something, you know. Um, so I just had all of these like amazing experiences, you know, playing Wally's Jazz Cafe, having to improvise, spanky church, playing in a wedding band and having um, having to learn the songbook, you know, having to learn some music. And so Ricky Minor had called me for the Latifa gig and I, I was just, I was ready. You know what I mean? I just had all those experiences prepared me. If I didn't have those experience, I don't know, you know, maybe I would have lost the gig. I, I, I don't know. You know what? Um, that story just, just, just blew me away um, because uh, oh. Eddie Spinky Alfred was, you know, just a real dear brother to me. And, um, you know, I, I was a kid when I um, discovered, you know, Spanky as a kid, um, listening to, you know, The Clouds, that live and direct record. Just that's the record. That's the one. And, um, you know, between Spanky and Richard Wallace, I, I would just be blown away by those guys. And then as I got older, when I had a chance to really meet him and become... You know, we became good, good friends, and our brotherhood was really strong. And um, um, you're so right. Spanky, all he did, sun up and sun down, was play guitar. And just to know that you got that, um, you're right. That's, first of all, to, lead, <laughs> to, quit, to quit school, to go to the country, and the gut book it in the backwoods. <laughs> he anointed my hands with Crisco oil at a storefront church. I swear to God. Okay, so so no wonder why you so funky. You you still got the grease all on you. You. <laughs> now that's some country. That's country right there. I'm gonna tell you. I love it. I love it. I love it. But but he was just and still is. Just you know, just just the greatest, and so to hear that story, I appreciate you sharing that with me because it's he was his heart was so big, heart of gold, and um, for him to do that is just crazy. But what's even more incredible for you to take him up on his offer? Oh my goodness, to just just leave school, never return to a big big school like you, Berkeley, right? Just to leave that alone, to go sit down. And, and and sit with this guy for a week, and you got all of that, and then he gives you this this great this great nugget about go join the Black Pentecostal Church. Listen, th listen, I get it now because yeah, you're right. I think because 
you already had that in you, but now you're like, you're getting that DNA in you. You're really learning what it is. I mean, listen, you getting the drive from the, from the greatest in the world, a greatest in the world. And when it comes to quartet music is you getting the drive, you getting all of that stuff. So for you to have that behind you, it's opening up my eyes to see like, why you are who you are and how you're made as a guitar player. I totally get it. So, so then you went to the, you got the call from Ricky Minor to do Queen Latifah's gig. Now, did you have to relocate or did you continue to stay where you were? How did that happen? So I did relocate. I didn't plan on it. Um, <laughs> basically what had happened was I auditioned for Britney Spears' Onyx tour years ago. Um, flew out on my own dime. A friend of mine's grandfather uh, is Ernie Fields Jr., a horn arranger, who was partners with Ricky on a lot of stuff. So it was kind of like, let her come out and audition, just do us a favor. You know, she's obviously not going to get the gig. You know, it's like, just let them have their day in the sunshine. So I beat everybody out, and it was just down to me and Errol Cooney, another one of my favorite guitar players, uh, that was the first time I ever met Errol. Um, and there was one other guy, and he got the gig. So that was the first time Ricky was like, who's that? Oh, okay. You know, and I remember he said, I got you up here, and I'll, I'll let you know, you know, when the time's right. Flew out one more time for a different artist to audition. Again, flew out on my dime from Boston. Didn't get the gig. Ricky, you know, what, am I doing something wrong? You know, it, and he was just like, no, you just you just never know. You don't know if they want to look. You don't know if they want experience. You, you just don't know what that particular person is looking for. But again, I remember him pointing to his head and being like, I'll call you when the time's right. So he called me. Um, and basically what, what happened was he was like, I need you to be here like now. Just book a ticket. You know, we'll, we'll take care of it. Don't even pack, like just grab your guitar, just grab a couple of quick clothes, like come to the, just get on the first flight. Um, Cause they had rehearsal in the morning um, and it was already like afternoon in Boston, you know? So I get through security. I literally just had my guitar, like a couple of stomp boxes, you know, in the back and like a pair of underwear or something. And I'll never forget, he called and he just said, congratulations, the gig is yours to lose. And it took me a second to even understand what he meant. And I'm like, oh, my God, I got the gig. Holy, you know, so I, I went out there and, you know, Teddy Campbell on drums. And, um, you know, I mean, just a, a whole a killing band. of Everybody had just been working. So basically, we did that tour. And um, it was with Jill Scott and Erica Badu and Flo a Tree. So it was kind of like the Black Girl Lilith Fair tour, and I got to meet, you know, Adam Blackstone was MDing for Jill Scott, and he was a youngin back, I mean, we were all young back then. And um, so that, you know, there were so many relationships that happened because of that. I actually got to work with Prince because of that. I can tell you that story if you want, but um, it was only a couple of days. Um, but but uh, I remember the tour ended in LA and I'm like, I I didn't think this far. I didn't know if I'd ever get to go on tour in my life. Um, and I was sort of ready to go home and I got the call uh, to play for Mary Mary. And and Cornel Corny, Cornelius Mims, love that guy. He was the MD and maybe Teddy just called Corny and was like, hey, they're gonna play guitar. So that was, you know, I was like, I have a gig now after that. So I just, I just stayed, but it wasn't a plan. You know, um, wow, yeah. that's 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 interesting. But yeah, but let's back up. Let's rewind because I, yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. got I got to hear no, I got to hear that Prince story. Let's go. I'm ready for it. Oh, the Prince one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, um, the last day of the tour, which also was the first day I ever met Jubu, and I, I got to find the footage somewhere. Erica threw a. Uh, a tour rap party at the Key Club. I don't even know if that place is that still around in LA. Used to be on Sunset. I, I, I'm I'm not sure. I, I can't. Yeah. Tell. I don't know. So, anyways, it was just a jam for all of us to just let loose because we had just been playing parts, you know, the whole summer. 
Um, so Juba would showed up at that and just, I got to find the footage somewhere. It's like on an old phone, but holy sh... Yeah, that, that, that took me out. Um, but anyways, apparently Prince was there. And he, so Prince had come to another show and you knew when Prince was there because we'd be backstage and there'd be like a golf cart and they'd be like, everyone get out. And we're like, this is our backstage. Who's, you know, we were just kind of like, make way for who, you know? So we had known like if Prince was in the building, so he didn't talk to anybody, you know, apparently he was just up in the rafters, just, just observing. Um, so he had heard me play and, um, I get a call from someone, I can't remember how long after, just, uh, hey, you know, Prince wants you to come to this address and audition for him. I'm like, man, who the fuck is this? <laughs> you know, Prince playing with me. Um, and I hung up on them, you know, because I was just like, just don't, just don't mess. Um, and they called back and they were like, no, 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 don't hang up. Listen, he was at the key club and he heard you perform. And seriously, can you please show up at this address? So um, this was 2005. So this was like the 3121 record era. That's when Cora and Josh, Tamar, um, I can't remember who was on keys, but it wasn't like Morris or anything at that time, at least when I was there auditioning. And um, so I had to show up at his house off of Doheny at like midnight and I'm 22, 23 years old, like going to Prince's house, you know, I'm, I'm like, it's so big, I can't comprehend it. But I remember um, somebody gave me some of the best musical advice I've ever heard, which I'd love to share, which is I'm, I'm telling them like, I, I can't do this. I'm freaking out. Like, what? I don't know what, you know, imposter syndrome and all that. And I'm just like, I don't know how I'm gonna hold my composure in front of the man. And he said, listen, Nobody's bigger than the music. No one's bigger than the music itself. And that just for some reason floored me because I was like, all right, it's not the man. It's music I need to be afraid of. Not the person who made it. It's the music itself. Not that you should be afraid of music, but like the intimidation should come from there. So that helped me humanize Prince so that I wasn't, you know, just tripping up. So anyways, first night, <laughs> it's such a funny story. I get in the house. Nobody greets me. There's an elevator that's wrapped in purple velvet. And it's like some Willy Wonka shit. I mean, it's literally just purple velvet with the gold insignia. I hear music. I take it up to the top floor. I turn the corner. There's this massive room. And um, he's got a giant, um, uh, what do you call it, projector. And it's playing like Sly. Um... Maybe it was, I can't remember if it was from Midnight, whatever that show is with Wolfman Jack. Midnight Special? Um, yeah, I can't remember if it was Midnight, but I remember it was Sly playing on this big projector. The twins were like doing some crazy, you know, dancing. Um, nobody was up there yet. And there was just this giant parquet floor with the Prince logo in the middle of it, like a basketball court. Candles around the whole perimeter. And the whole band set up. And I see Prince's leopard telly in the cloud. And I mean, all his iconic guitars. I'm just like, holy shit. Um, so the first night we just rehearsed and it was Tamar's music, not Prince's music. He came, he didn't say a word. He was just, you know, with a gorgeous woman and just listened. He had on, I'll never forget, he had this like sweater with the collar that goes out like that with the little slit in it he had these like leggings and he had the little kid shoes you know that lit up with the wheels you know what i'm saying so that that was that was a lot um and so he didn't say anything the first night so i'm like you know I, 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 maybe he's not feeling me so we rehearsed some of tamar's music which was killing and uh after the end of the first night um i go home and they're like you know we'll be in touch so I get a call back. I'm like, oh shit, okay, cool, cool, okay. So I go back the next day, but the next day, Prince is on. He, he's he's ready to rehearse. So he, you know, comes up to me and, hi, I'm Prince, and, you know, hi, nice to meet you. Um, so we start rehearsing some music, and I wish I could remember what it was. Because it's not like they gave me music ahead of time, you know. And I remember 
the greatest thing happening was I played something and he just said, that's too funky, stop. So I was like, oh shit, did he just tell me I'm too funky? Damn. And he, he meant it as a compliment, but he also literally meant that's too funky. He goes, no, no, no. I need you to think like Elton John. I'm like, Elton John? And I know what he meant. He wanted like a heavy left hand, like the piano, just real, you know, just kind of big guitar, not those smaller like zap chords and lady cab driver. You know, he just wanted me. And he put me through, and I know everybody's got a Prince story that, you know, that we know, but he put me through that test where he's like, all right, you know, play this. Okay. Yeah, cool. I got it. All right. Now add this. And he was just kind of doing a Jenga thing, like just trying to add more and more stuff onto the stack to see when the guitar part would kind of collapse or whatever. So we rehearsed for a while. And then um, I should mention that like Josh and Cora and all them, they were a band, right? So I was the only person coming in from from the outside that wasn't a part of their their tight woven you know group. So they went downstairs. They left for like what felt like 45 minutes where I'm just up there by myself. Now I had heard from other people, I don't know if it was from, you know, knowing Questlove or something, but I had just heard the stories like, yo, this man's got cameras everywhere. Everything's being taped, everything's being recorded. So, you know, I knew to be on my best behavior, but they were gone for 45 minutes. And I don't know why I did this. And maybe, but I'm looking at all his guitars and I'm looking at the leopard telly and I'm like, man, I just want to play that thing so bad. I just want to bring that thing up so bad. And I'm like, I know he's probably got a camera on me, but I honestly remember at that point, A, it's just so crazy I'm here this opportunity and I just thought oh fuck it I gotta pick this thing up you know and and so I picked up all his fucking guitars and I know they were probably like this white motherfucker like what the you know like (laughs) um so they come back and they went downstairs this is like some Chappelle shit but they went downstairs to make milk and cookies so they left me up there and they went downstairs to make a batch of chocolate chip cookies. So they came up. I don't remember if we rehearsed, and I went home, and, and that was it. Now, I, so I didn't get the gig. I was kind of feeling away, like, oh, you know, what did I do wrong? However, that tour, I lost the gig to Prince because Prince played guitar. And I don't think Mike Scott, who's also a friend of mine, I don't think Mike came back until a little bit later. So basically I was auditioning to play guitar, you know, behind Prince, but he didn't end up getting anyone. And I know that I'm one of many, 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 many guitar players that he tried. But the fact that I got a call at 22, you know, uh, it was cool. So were there any like repercussions for you picking up the... The, the, the leopard telly, was there any... <laughs> no, I remember the action was really low. I remember the strap was like, it had to have been the original from Purple Rain. I mean, that thing was tattered. Wow. Um, but I, I just, you know, when you pick up an old, like an old jazz bass and the neck is all oiled and, you know, glosses off, like it just... <sighs> I don't regret it, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't regret it. Was, it. was that was that that was the uh, was it the Honda or something like that? Was it called? Was it guitar? The owner. The owner. The yeah, owner. the owner. Was that but, was, but, was was it the original? The owner. Yeah. So I mean, he's had some copies. I swear, this must have been the the H S Anderson original because okay. that thing was worn out. But okay. speaking of Honda, um, not to name drop, but I'm good friends with Jesse Johnson. And he was telling me that the guitar tone on the time 777-9311 was actually Jesse's Hondo. And it was like, he said it was like a hundred dollar, you know, little Hondo strap copy. Um, It might have had like feathers on it or or something crazy. And he was like, yeah, you know, he just grabbed it. And that's what what that tone is. He's like, it's a hundred dollar guitar. And by the way, don't worry about name dropping. This is why you're here. People want to oh, know. Yeah. People, I mean, I love Jesse. People so want to know these stories, and and you know the the fact that you know you're you're you 
you know your background and so this is great the great stuff I'm, I'm really really loving it so you didn't get the press yeah. gig now what tell me because you you work with Erica Badu for quite a while school as well right that was my main that was like my main gig for about eight years I was in the band yeah that was like my main gig and my favorite gig ever now when you did Erica Badu Badu, were you living, did you, were you still living in L.A. or? Uh, yeah, so I was in L.A. and, you know, would just fly out for spot dates and um, obviously fly to Dallas for rehearsals and stuff like that. And, I mean, I was still doing stuff in L.A. I played with Layla Hathaway and her band for a little bit. Um, just did a lot of, like, rain on St Angie Stone, TV shows, Neo and played guitar on a Janet Jackson tour, not on tour. I, I recorded all of the guitars. I uh, can't, it was like around 2010, whatever tour wow. that was. Wow. So, I mean, you know, I was, I was doing a lot of different things, but the main, like, I'm going to the airport gig was uh, Erica. I was in Eric Benet's band for a while. Love Eric. Wow. Um, that was really fun. So, so you um, spent a lot, you spent a lot, of, a lot of time in the whole soul, the Neil soul, world you spend a yeah. lot of time in that world i mean you know back then there were only so many of us you know and i'm not saying like oh i'm an originator of anything i'm just saying in terms of working guitar players back then agape jerry jaris mosey eric walls you know me errol cooney uh tim stewart i mean there were like 10 of us all just kind of you know, now there's a lot of musicians, right, you know, right. um, and that sound has a jubile too, obviously, but um, I'm gonna leave that alone just on the sound of, of, of Neo Soul guitar, okay. but, but no, what's um, your thought? What, what's your, what's your take on the sound of Neo Soul guitar? Has it, has well, it changed or what's your take on it? It has. I mean, I'm hesitant to say something because I don't want to ever demean someone or, uh, make someone feel bad about something f that speaks to them, you know, sure. like, but I guess what I want to say is that, you know, Neo Soul, that title was, you know, obviously like created for marketing and promo. Like, I mean, Badu and D'Angelo, they don't, they don't like that word, you know, but Spanky was to me the sound and Jubu, you know, of that, that stuff, you know, dating back. I mean, it, it all goes way back, way, way back. But I mean, if we're talking, the Maxwell era, Wah Wah Watson, all that stuff. Who I also, you know, was a mentor. I got a funny Wah Wah Watson story to tell you. He cussed me the fuck out. Okay, let's so talk sorry. about. Let's talk. Let's go there right now. I gotta hear okay. the Wah Wah Watson story. Oh my okay. goodness, you're killing me over here. Did you ever work with him? By no, the way? no. I wish to God. I only wish to. God. Okay, so um, this had to have been around like. 2007, 2008, I got a call and I was touring with uh, Jack Ashford, the Motown funk brother who played Vibes and Tambourine. We did a couple of tours together. We even did a tour. Uh, matter of fact, Foley, famous Foley, played lead bass with Miles. That's my guy. Played bass. That's yeah, my, he that played is bass my guy. Yep. on one of the tours. And we did a tour too where we were backing up George Clinton. And so Foley would play like Jamerson on a jazz bass with rounds um, for Jack Ashford's set, and then he would go play drums for George's set. But anyway, um, you know, I think you know for me, like I like to try and get get really close to the sounds, the articulation, that the essence of what, what made that music so special, because it ain't just the notes, obviously. Right. So I just remember, all right, well, I'm playing a lot of this stuff that Wah Wah played on, maybe he'd be cool if I just asked him a couple of questions. So I got his number from somebody. And I remember him being really defensive, like, why do you need to know all that? Why, you know, I was like, no man, it's cool. I'm, I'm playing with, uh, I'm, I'm playing in Jack's band and I just I just wanna do this music, you know, your parts justice. So, so um, we, we had a cool, so, you know, he sort of mentored me. We talked on the phone a bunch. Never got to meet him in person. He never gave me a guitar lesson, per se, but I would send him music, and he would listen, and he would suggest stuff. So the first time 
he said, um, send me something. I, I want to, I want to hear you. I want to hear your soul. So I sent him this thing that was like, you know, uh, it had like a Quincy Jones crybaby, Rolls Royce, that kind of sound, you know, and he really liked it. And he gave me some great advice and it was mostly just about creating space. Just like, we'll see how this part overlaps that and you're taking focus away from, you know, so I, I learned a lot about that. So he said, I like you, send me something else. So this was the biggest mistake. Cause I'm like, cause I did a, wait till he gets a load of this, you know? Cause the first track, I wasn't really trying to impress him. It was just kind of like, I don't know. It was what I was, uh, it was what I was feeling. So the next track was like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna just do like a best of wah wah, like wait till he gets a load of this. So, I mean, I had all of his shit down, you know, down to the phaser and the wah and the, you know, the, the, the sample hold pedal that he used and just everything, you know, I mean, I admired him and I was a kid then. So I didn't have a sound really, you know, I was just searching for myself and other people's sound, you know? And um, so I, I sent him this thing and I remember he called me and whenever I would see him show up on my phone, I'd be so excited, you know? And I just go, hey, Wa, what's going on? And he just goes, you think you mean motherfucker? And I was like, oh shit. And he's like, you think you me, dog? He's like, let me tell you something. When I hear another motherfucker do me, it makes my fucking stomach churn. You ain't me, dog. You will never be me. I was like, oh, shit. And he goes, I'll tell you what. I'm going to fart. What's it smell like? You don't know. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, man. So imagine getting cussed out by your hero. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, oh, shit. This guy hates me. And I just really fucking pissed him off. And that was the last thing in the world I wanted to do. So he kind of calmed down. And he said, you know I like you because if I didn't like you, I wouldn't cuss you out. And I came to learn later on in life that like he cussed everybody out that he liked, you know, in different different kind of ways and stuff like that. And we got along really well because I remember I said one thing to him one time, which I, I feel like really opened up the books in terms of him just kind of sharing a lot. But I said, you know, man, it's like, it's not that you play guitar parts. I'm like, it's like you're an orchestrator. It's like you orchestrate your parts, you know, and he's like, that's it. And nobody gets that. And, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm orchestrating them. It's not a, I'm not just playing a bunch of shit and whatever. So over the years, you know, he would just, we talk on the phone. He sent me something to play on, you know, on his record, actually. I was like, you want me to play on your record? So we just had like a fun relationship, just talking about stuff and, and, I wish he was, you know, still here today. And and it was great being able to talk to him because, I mean, that was a completely different thing than, like, say, Spanky. You know what I mean? In terms of a musical approach. Um, so that just taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about space and and looking at the, the music like it's a drum. You know, I remember he just said every guitar part's a drum. It, it, it should feel like a drum part. It should feel like something that somebody would want to tap out on a hi-hat, on a floor tom. You know, so he, he taught me a lot. And, and um, I remember one thing I'll just share with your listeners was he had this old um, maestro rhythm king, the, the, the Sly, the Sly Funk Box, that, that one, like on Family Affair. And he used to pick a preset and it'd be like, you know, a cheesy little organ drum beat. But he would isolate an element, whether it's a clave part, didn't matter what it was. And he would go after that and he would play a rhythm to it, locked in, dead locked in. And then on the drum machine, you can push in multiple buttons. So you can push in like foxtrot and cha-cha and you get all of these cross rhythms. And as a guitar player, you're not used to hearing these rhythms. As a percussionist, sure, you know, you have to practice all those patterns. But that taught him different rhythms to get inside of the music in different rhythmic routes that guitar players wouldn't normally take. So he always stressed the essence of practicing to the funk box. So just a little guitar tip. Or wow, that's 
You know, first of all, that that <laughs> that story. <laughs> He's wild, right? I love it. I think that some of this is like Forrest Gump. I just <laughs> out for some crazy stuff. I, I love it. I love it. Love it. You know, so you know, it's 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 crazy because you were you're truly connected to like some of the great ones. I mean, and getting you know, and getting great, great, you know, um, um, being taught um, by the great ones, especially when it comes down to the element of of groove. And I see why, I see why you are who you are. You totally get it. I mean, you know, and and then there's then there's Bootsy Collins that you're that you you know that you friends with and these people you get you get to hear this stuff in real time from the creators and the inventors of all this great music that you know I grew up with and love and still love to this day it's my favorite there's nothing for, to me there's nothing funkier than a James Brown groove it just don't get no funkier than that for me that's just me period I can listen to it. I think the only, for me, the only thing that'll touch that is thank you for talking to me, Africa, off there's a riot going on. That one groove. Listen, listen. <laughs> it, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're talking about from the same world though, of music, because when you talk yeah. about slide, when you talk about slide, now, you know, nothing's funkier than slide. Nothing's funkier yeah. than James. That It's the same yeah. world. That, that It's that grease. It's that whole thing that you totally get and I see why because you you know you were you were um, jumped into that world you know by by Spanky you know it goes back to that and I think for me just outside looking in is had you not had that you would never understand the rest of it but when by because you under yeah. because you got the Spanky thing you understood everything else that came at you maybe different vibrations or different styles of the funk or Whatever, you know, Spanky was just an all-around cat. He was jazz, he was blues, he was gospel, he was quartet, and quartet ain't nothing but the grease, you know. So, so I, you know, I, I'm learning so much about you, and maybe, and now I see why I'm such a fan of what it is. And obviously, everyone else is, because you have these personal relationships with the greats. I mean, you know, Jesse Johnson, I mean, who's just, you know, just ridiculously just incredible, um, and all the people that you're associated with. So, after Erica, eight years, eight years with Erica Badu, then, then what comes next for you, for Ella? What comes next? It's it's kind of an interesting story, and and maybe a sad one for some people, but with a happy ending. Um, I quit. I quit. I quit music, sort of. I left LA. Um, I moved here to the mountains. I didn't want to tour. I, I had some stuff going on in my personal life, I think you know. And I just needed um I needed a safe space, you know, and LA didn't re at the, that time it didn't feel like it. Um but I had to make a living, obviously. You know, I I don't have the luxury of being independently wealthy to just go, oh, I'm just gonna quit and do nothing. Um so I was always fascinated by orchestration. And I had some amazing opportunities like playing with, with the Roots, backing up Jay-Z at Carnegie Hall and Radio City Music Hall and being like enveloped with the orchestra around us, like just hearing them tune up and getting goosebumps. And, and it, you know, it, it fascinated me. I was like, I, I want to do this. I don't want to be on the road anymore. Um, I, I want to do this. I want to sit from home and orchestrate music for composers and movies and video games and stuff like that. Um, I did a concert. Uh, this, I'm sure you, maybe you've heard of it. It's called Sweet, uh, Sweet for Ma Dukes. And it was an orchestral tribute to Jay Dilla, the late Jay Dilla. It was orchestrated by my friend Miguel Atwood Ferguson. And I would say that that was around 2010. Manyongo Jackson was playing, Kareem Riggins on drums, Thundercat was playing bass way before he was famous. Me, still in Badu's band at the time, and, and a symphony. And that really opened it up for me, just like, oh, well, this guy's my age and he's doing this, you know? Um, I, I just thought you had to be like 70 years old to be an orchestrator or something like that, you know? I don't know why. So I just, I moved here, I had some money saved up, 
I did my 10,000 hours. I studied a lot of the scores of Maurice Ravel, French composer. And I got a gig orchestrating for a video game company called um, Bungie, and they make a game called Destiny. And it's a pretty big, I mean, it's a really big game. And so I've been the lead orchestrator on that project for, I mean, what, almost 10 years now. Wow. And that was paying the bills, and I wasn't playing guitar. And to get into present time with the, um, fucking just this, the little Silk Sonic thing, like, um, is this cool, this this story to go here? or Absolutely, okay. absolutely, yes. Um, so I didn't play guitar for five years to the point where, I mean, they had cobwebs on them. The bridge broke off of two of them. I mean, I didn't touch them. Um, Bruno called me uh, while he was working on Silk Sonic and he would just want to talk about gear, just guitars, guitar players, records. I'd kind of expose, oh, check out creative source migration, check this out. And, you know, we would just have conversation about gear and music. Eventually after a bunch of calls, he's like, I'm working on a record. Do you want to play guitar on it? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll play on it. So <clears throat> the truth is I hadn't played in five years. I didn't even have an audio interface anymore. And Bruno Mars is calling me to play on this new album. So I have to somehow summon summon the demons, so to speak, be able to, to, to you know, <laughs> and write some parts and, and get a sound and do all that stuff. And the first song turned out to be Leave the Door Open, which, you know, I got a Grammy certificate and the plaque and all that. Um, and I ended up playing on half the record. But the truth was, Bruno Mars got me back into playing guitar. Um, and I mean, I, I don't, I don't know if I should talk about like you know my my personal life. No, but, no, no, but basically, no. Listen, you could please, you could talk about anything you want, anything you want. Okay. Well, for those that don't know, I'm a trans woman, and um, so I was transitioning during the making of that album. Um, so it was a heavy time, and. Uh, I didn't know what music meant to me anymore. You know, I, I just didn't, I was just, you know. So once I transitioned and I began to live authentically, you know, as who I've always been, um, music started to just present itself in a way where I found who I was again through music. I mean, music never let me down. It never lets any of us down. Um, it's always been there for us. I knew I wanted it back in my life, you know, but again, I, I just didn't know how I didn't want to tour anymore. So I'm like, I, what does this mean now playing guitar and I'm on this record? And, and so it just sort of led to present day, which was that by me being authentic and, and living as who I actually am, uh, I just wanted to share my life with people, my experiences and share things that I knew. And that's why with my Instagram page, um, I'm teaching every day because it's love and I'm, uh, I'm trying to just spread love and share things that I learned um, to, to pay it forward, like the musical generosity that was given to me by many musicians and mostly black men, you know, that, that valued me and was like, okay, I'll show them some stuff, you know. And I, I wouldn't be who I am or where I am without people taking the time to, to, to show me things and, and share things and welcome me into situations, you know? Um, so, I mean, yeah, that's sort of present present day. I mean, I, I played on that record. I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to have been thought of to play on it. I'm proud of the record because, you know, as musicians, we all get calls to play on stuff. And, you know, it's like, okay, well, I can do this, obviously. But maybe the music doesn't resonate. Or maybe it's like, oh, um, they probably should have called so-and-so. Like, that's way more their wheelhouse, even though I can knock it out of the park. And I just felt with Silk Sonic, I'm like, yeah, you want Philly 1973? Like, I got you. I, I know what, you know, you need Norman Connors. You need, you know, Roland Chamber. Like, I got you. Eli, you know, um, 
so I, you know, I just felt like this is such a good fit. Like, I just feel like whatever it is I'm doing is making a contribution to this music. And it's just so good. And, and it happened to win, you know, a bunch of awards and stuff. But it just felt good. I was like, yeah. I'm, and it's the same feeling playing in Erica's band. I just feel like I belong inside of her music. And I know how to listen and give her what she wants and contribute. And it feels like a good fit where maybe there's another situation, like I said, where I can do the gig but I don't really feel like I fit in. And I, and I don't mean because someone's not welcoming. I'm just like, yeah, but that stuff, I live that stuff. You know what I mean? Like, I live that music. Just like when Bootsy called me and, you know, he'd be like, I need, give me your best catfish. And Jimmy, no, I'm just like, I live that, man, I, I put this stuff on every morning. You know what I mean? So I'm just like, I feel so good about it. Not just because it's Bootsy calling me, but I'm like, Man, like, you know, this is what I do every morning. Like, it's a great feeling, you know? So, yeah. Listen, I, I'm, I'm giving you a major, major standing ovation. And I think... Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I have so much respect for your story. And I guess one question I have for you is how, since the transition, how have you been received by people in the industry, your, your your comrades, your workers, your your associates? How have you been received? It's a great question. I mean, for the most part, it's been nothing but love. Um, my previous relationships, pre-transition, have just been more cultivated, more authentic, realer, just enriched, you know? Um, it's opened up a lot of new doors. Uh, you know, of, of people finding out about me in a, in a different way, in a different light. Um, definitely had some doors closed. I'm not going to mention names because they got they got to live with sure. whatever they they're going through. Um, I got to be honest. I was really concerned because being the only white chick in bands and and being around you know black folks. I never felt, you know, any any way in terms of, you know, I'm, I don't feel welcomed, but playing in black church and the homophobia coming from maybe the pastor or something while the minister of music and the entire choirs, you know, LGBTQ plus or whatever, I felt a way about it. It, it. it didn't sit with me right that these people here in the choir are ministering to your congregation and enriching them but you're judging their life. And so they didn't even really know about trans people to even talk about trans people in church. And, and I shouldn't just say black church, all church, but that was my experience. So I was kind of petrified coming out like, well, I know how they think about a lot of gay people. What are they going to think about me? Is my career over? Are people going to be embarrassed to be associated with me? And honestly, all my church, I mean, almost all of them called me personally, just wanted to talk, share stuff, tell, them, tell me they're proud of me. Because I think anyone that knew me back then, I was just tortured, you know, I, it was just hard. I mean, music just was the only thing that would keep me, keep me here, you know. And um, so I think they just identified with like, well, we didn't see that coming, but we understand, we get it. We get it. We get what you were going through. We didn't know what you were going through, but we knew you were going through something, you know. And uh, it was really amazing how people just showed up because I, I feel like I jumped off of a cliff without a parachute in front of everybody, <laughs> you know. And I think a lot of people admired it and um, it rippled through a lot of people's lives. It held up a mirror to other people's lives, sometimes in a beautiful way, like, you know, and sometimes in a terrifying way. And and you didn't ask, but I want to share this, just that when I did come out and share my story, I didn't know what to expect. But what I didn't expect was thousands of messages. And it wasn't necessarily just, hey, I'm really happy for you or, you know, 
that's crazy or whatever. What it actually was, was all of these people confiding their truth in me, that they weren't comfortable sharing with the world. So you have no idea the amount of messages from straight men like, hey, I got to be honest, like I've always been attracted to trans women or I'm dating a trans woman and I don't know what to do or, hey, I think I'm trans or I know I'm trans or, you know, I'm in an unhappy marriage. I'm homosexual. I'm non but just everybody coming out of the woodwork. Wow. And I'm like, oh, wow, most people are going through some stuff, you know, and, and, and it, it taught me a lot about humanity and people and it inspired me and encouraged me to be me. And I didn't expect it just because, and I hope this doesn't come across as arrogant, but having those exchanges with people made me feel like me being me encourages other people to be who they are, whoever that is. You know, it gave, it, it gave them comfort. It comforted them to see me being visible in spite of hatred and transphobia that I've received and people not wanting me to exist or whatever, it gave them just permission to be themselves and encouragement and comfort. And I mean, to me, that's like more valuable than any guitar lesson, you know, I'll ever teach. Um, so yeah, you, you thank you for sharing that. No, 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 absolutely. You said something a, a minute ago um, about before the change, before you kind of came out, you said you it was hard on you. You said you went through a lot. It was tough. You said something like that. Well, yeah. Ex explain, explain what you what you mean by that. What, what's what's that all about? Well, I mean, I can only speak from my personal life experience, but I can tell you, for most girls like me, we know who we are at a very young age. We might not have language for it. But we know something's, something's not right here. Something's, this is all wrong. Like, like wires got crossed or something like that. So I knew who I was somewhere between three and five years old, but I'm 40, I'm almost 43 years old. In the eighties, you know, there wasn't an option to you know, tell my parents I'm trans or something. I mean, I would have been homeschooled. I would have been on probably like electroshock therapy or it just wasn't a reality. So I had to live my life I had to create a life, which is why I think initially I, I came into music because I needed a mask to stay alive. Um, because I had to create a person, a character to just get through life because I wasn't living my life as female. Um, so having to live in a body that doesn't feel like your own and looking in the mirror and being like, I don't, I don't, I don't know who that is. I don't, I don't recognize that person. Um, it's incredibly just distressing and traumatic. And um, so I did it for 40 years and there were just a lot of times I didn't, didn't want to be around, but music, if I'm being honest, I think part of my gift or, or craft or whatever word you want to use came from being distressed and feeling dysphoria and just going down a road in music like all right i'm gonna listen to this record and pick it apart like a telephone and take it apart and put it back together so i was learning things but i was learning things to avoid what was actually happening um in my life wow. you know because i couldn't i just couldn't i couldn't deal would you know deal with the the pain of it um and you didn't ask this, but I'm just going to say it. I think, you know, a lot of people who don't understand think that there's some sort of fad happening. And the truth is, we've always been here. It's just simply that it feels like a safer place now to be able to do it. It still ain't safe. It's not safe at all, you know. Um, but it feels safer. And I think a lot of people don't get it and they, they, they think it's some fad or that people, like it's impossible for people to know who they are. And you know, people, uh, people who know who they are don't go their entire lives questioning. You know what I mean? Like if someone is straight, for example, they don't go their whole lives questioning why they're straight. They just, they don't even think about it. It's just, that's who I'm attracted to. Or, you know, if you're a cis man, like, 
you don't go your whole life thinking about your identity and should you be a guy and why doesn't you feel why don't you feel good in these like cis people don't do that you know at all trans people do um and uh so i you know i, I just want to be visible to normalize um what it looks like to be trans which kind of feels like a ridiculous thing to say because it's like what does a black person look like everything <laughs> everything you know um but to a lot of people with trans folks it's like they think they have an idea oh a trans person looks like these two things you know so i'm trying to get people to care about trans lives through teaching music and and especially protecting my black trans sisters because nobody on this planet has it harder than a black trans woman sadly as you know a lot of people don't even care about a black life unfortunately which is which is just deeply saddening and 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 it's just sad but they really don't care about a black trans life you know and that's why black trans women get murdered and boy we're going deep but like the thing with the Chappelle thing which again a lot of people don't understand is that we can take a joke we clown on each other all the time we score on each other all the time but what he's doing is he's dehumanizing a group of people and putting a target on their back and letting other people know that these people aren't really real and they don't exist and their lives don't really matter. And we welcome humor and we welcome talking about, you know, the awkward thing of me transitioning at 40 years old and, and going through second, like there's a lot of funny things, but what he's doing is he's sharing hateful opinions. There, there's no punchline. You know, one of his jokes is just like, I met Jim Carrey in the 90s and he stayed in character as Andy Kaufman and I got really annoyed that he was pretending. And that's how I feel about trans people. Like, that, it, it's not a joke, it's not a punchline, it just, it's a hateful opinion that you don't think we're real. And that endangers the lives of black trans women. It endangers my life because I get hateful messages. Like, yeah, Chappelle's funny, cry about it. And it's, upsetting that people don't get that like that's hate speech like that's not funny i'd laugh at it if it was funny you know you can make a, a joke and i know this is stereotypical maybe i'll get canceled but you can make a joke like oh some black people are loud in a movie theater okay stereotypical yes true no not a hoys but that acknowledges that black people are real and they exist and it doesn't dehumanize a group of people do you know what i mean like whether you think that joke is funny or not, that's for you to decide. But talking about trans people and, you know, dehumanizing us, like there's no comedy in that for anyone. There, there's nothing funny about that at all, you know? And, and we're just, we're trying to, I'm just literally trying to exist, man. You know, like I'm just trying to be happy and exist. And so something's going on with him over there. Something's going on because you, you don't you don't make three specials about trans people unless you're fascinated and there's something going on over mm -hmm. there. You you don't you, mm -hmm. you don't care enough. You don't you, mm -hmm. you don't even think about it. So you can cut that part out of the interview if you want, but no. you know, no. um, I, I never will. Listen, let me let me just let me top that off by saying this: it's it's um. And they might cancel me, but you know, so whatever it is, it is what it is. But you talk about black trans women, that's one thing. And, and you know, I don't know about that, I, I, but I'm agreeing with you. Um, but not only that, you know, how, how they don't care about black trans women. You know, as far as we as black people, you know, for as far as I'm concerned, there's not enough people, there's not enough black people caring about black, about black people. Um, if that was the case, we would stop killing each other. But yet and still, we want to raise a flag and say Black Lives Matter. You can hate me for saying that, but go look at the numbers and read the statistics on, on you know, who's killing who. Um, so it is supposed to be about love, but until we start loving ourselves as black folk and stop killing each other. Um, all right, I'm going to top that off right there. I want to go back. Um, yeah. And ask you this question. 
about, and this will be the last question about it. When you were, when you were going through what you was going through, were you alone? Did you did you have a friend? Did you confide in anybody, or did you you just kept this all to yourself? It felt like swallowing swallowing a bomb. I didn't want to share it with anyone. Um, I didn't trust anyone, and. Um, you got to remember, I mean, the, the world's different now. Like now, if that was something I was going through, I, I would feel safe enough to do it. But for all those years, I just didn't think there was an option. Like, okay, share this. And then what? You know, and then I'm liberated. I'm emancipated from this. You know, I can start living authentically. Like, you know, I, I, it just didn't feel safe. I felt like I would have just been beaten up and bullied and othered and just... You know, sometimes even today, I wonder what would my life be like um, if I if I didn't play music and I didn't have that as a gift or a craft or whatever. What would my life be like? You know, would I be doing sex work? Would I be like, I don't know. You know, I mean, people respect me because I put a lot of love and and and. Um, an expression of care into the world every day and I share something that I love and I give it away and I know people value me for that but if that stuff went away I mean I, I hope I'd still be surviving you know I, I, I don't know I, I don't know any better and I and I recognize my privilege of transitioning at 40 and already having a career you know it, it's hard for a lot of us that I don't have that skill set. You know what? You know, when, so. when you when you said that when you made when you came out and how you were getting all of these messages and thousands of people, you know, mm -hmm. really you could have probably you know took advantage of that and became a very a very rich woman and been the trans version of a Doctor Phil or something and started a reality TV show and I mean, been the host. Dude, you, have, yeah. you have no idea some mm -hmm. of the famous rappers that have slid into my DMs that if I said their names, I mean, A, I would never do that because um, I don't want to get hate crimed. Sure. But if people had any idea the amount of celebrities, athletes, famous, famous musicians, because I'm trans, we all talk. You know, the dolls all spill the tea. We know every celebrity that slept with one of us. I mean, we, we could normalize what it means to be us like that. Because every straight man would go, him, him, him? You know, it would be, men would be comforted because they wouldn't feel so isolated and alone if they happened to be a trans attracted man. They'd be like, this is beyond normal. And we know it's beyond normal because, you know, the search in porn, it's like trans is like number three. I mean, it just keeps rising and rising and rising. But through that isolation of feeling like you're different is scary to some people. And that's why some of those murders and, and violence happen is because of that isolation. Mm. Like any kind of violence against a black person, an Asian person, when you don't when you don't humanize that person and, and, and see them and there's guilt or shame about something, you know? Mm. Um, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for violence, but so that's why with us, again, to go back to Chappelle, it's like, that's dangerous for us. Mm. That literally gets us hurt, you know? If it was funny, we'd all laugh at it, uh, you know? Um, mm. So, uh, yeah, I've had some, and that's kind of been heartbreaking. There's been a couple of famous rappers where like, they don't give a fuck about that Grammy on the wall or they don't give a shit who I work with. Two of them didn't even know. They just, you know, they just knew I was trans and, and you know, and, and wanted what they wanted and that was it. And that kind of broke my heart. Like, wow, you don't even see me as a person? Like, wow. you, you know, it was just... So, yeah, I'm used to that. So are you talking yeah, about... Without, without getting too deep, you're not talking about... Them, they're coming out and then hitting on you, uh, like are wanting or just are come, are they sharing their personal stories? Are they trying to date you because then you so, coming out or what? I'm talking about famous rappers in my DMs wanting to take me somewhere and and get some, and then I had one famous rapper 
um, I, when I was working in Nashville and, um, you know, this dude like was deleting his messages to me as he was typing them. And it was like, tell me you're embarrassed to talk to me without telling me you're embarrassed to talk to me. And he didn't want like a paper trail or whatever. And I'm like, I'm cute as hell. I'm curvy. I'm successful. Like you're going to be embarrassed of me. Nah, bro. Like, I don't care who you are. I don't care. Don't care. But, you know, we don't put those men on blast because we don't want to get hurt, you know? And, and, and to be truthful, and I'm not trying to be arrogant about it, they're tortured. They don't sleep well at night because of that, because of those kind of secrets. And I know because I know what it was like for me not to live my truth. So, you know, their punishment is they got to just live with that. They have to live with the fact that they're attracted to someone and I guess what I want to say is they don't love themselves enough to honor who they want to be with. And granted, they may be coming at me in a very sexual way. That they may just literally want to love someone like me. Wow. And they don't they don't love themselves enough to just be like, yeah, I don't care what anyone else does. Like, you know, um, so I, I always have to remind myself, like, how can I ask them to put value on my life when they don't even value their own life? How can I, how can I possibly ask them to do that? You know, so I'm just kind of used to it. But I, but what I want to say though is that's not the majority of men. You know, it's just some. Some understood. Well, listen, I'm so glad that you you're sharing the story um, and sharing your truth and. And because it's important, Ella, it really is. Um, and I'm I'm also thankful that, you know, the people in the industry um, has accepted you and you know hasn't looked at you in any other way and and calling you, inviting you out, and you know um, that's that's awesome. You know, um, we live in a we live in a cruel world. This world is very cruel. People are, you know, I, you know, I don't even want to get so deep, but to, just to know that that you're still loved by your peers and the people you work with, and 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 myself included, and um, um, and I'm thankful of our relationship um, that I had a chance to connect with you because <laughs> by far you're one of the funkiest guitar players <clears throat> and I mean this if you ever get the itch you know to want to you know sit down or sit in and come hit with a band you know you can come over here with, with Chucky Booker uh, University anytime you I'm get sorry. ready all you gotta do is do 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 you know <laughs> and it's on and cracking like it trust me ready it, willing and able you it's on and crack you have a home right here anything anytime you just feel the need to come on and and it gets yeah, some of them, you know, anytime. So, so you know, Chucky feels the same way. He told he tells me to tell you. He told me to tell you what's up. By the way, um, but, oh, but uh, yeah, when he followed me, I was like, oh shit, I, I'm doing something right, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not trying to name drop, but like no. Wendy Melboy and you know Jimmy Jam, like just Phoebe Bridgers, pop art, just Raphael. Raphael Sadiq sent me the kindest message, and he was just like you're way over these cats' heads. Like, people aren't really getting what you're doing, you know, for certain people that, you know. And it's just cool to be able to, to that these people find me, that I that I admire, that I grow up listening, that, that have literally shaped who I am. You know, to be able to, like, talk to Jesse on the phone or Wendy. I mean, just people that I just... I just admire, like they. It's like, man, do you understand? Like the way I play is because I listen to you, and you you want to talk to me now. Like, it's just it blows my mind. Wow, wow, yeah, absolutely. So before I let you go, what are you doing today? What's what's on your plate right now? What are you working on? <laughs> I'm gonna work out after this. <laughs> <laughs> um. I got a couple of little ideas. I'm finishing up for Bootsy. I mean, I guess that's all I can say. But. I think I we talked about it, you know, some some stuff, and um, I actually have the rest of the day off, so I'm just gonna kind of do what I always do, probably put on some James Brown or some JBs, and just have fun and 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 groove, and just 
kind of take it easy today. It's it's a pretty light day. Cool, cool, yeah. cool. Listen, share, tell everybody how they can find you and how they can come and follow you, how they can get lessons from you, how they can just, just yeah, share that. Yeah, sure. Sure. So, I mean, I would say I'm most active on Instagram. Um, my Instagram is Ella underscore Ray, R-A-E underscore Feingold, F-E-I-N-G-O-L-D. You can hit me up through there. Um, I have a Patreon page, um, and that is like um, like longer format lessons, more in-depth. I feel like I can, you know... On Instagram, you have like 90 seconds to teach something on a reel, so it's very condensed. So Patreon, it's it's longer, um, and my Patreon is just Fine Gold Music. Um, I do have a website, <laughs> FineGoldMusic.com. It I need to update it. Um, and yeah, that's that's me. I'm on TikTok and YouTube, but I'd say Instagram. I'm I'm probably the most the most active. I can't thank you enough for, you know, coming on my platform and um, and sharing your story, not just your musical story, but your personal story. And yeah. I think I think what um, what 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 I'm happy and what I what I like and love the most is that, you know, you are you love yourself, and I think that is you said it. There's we don't love ourselves enough. And um, it starts there. And the first day we talked, I got that from you. I, I totally, totally got that from you. Um, how much Thank you, you. Were, how much you were, just you love yourself and appreciate it. Not in a cocky way, not in an arrogant way, but in a spiritual, mental way. Because I, 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 I feel bad for what you went through all those years. Kept it to yourself. Didn't. Um, didn't talk to anyone. That must have been, that must have been crazy. That feeling, not not talking, not having somebody you could share these things with. But now, you know, it's a different, you know, it's a different mindset, different mental thing, you know. And um, what what would you say to um, somebody who is right there um, that went through what you went? Through. How, what what kind of words of encouragement would you give to somebody that's dealing with the struggle? I mean, two things. One, it's like if you look at my page, I have a fair amount of followers, and everyone who's there just values who I am and just digs me. And I don't mean that in a in a self congratulatory, arrogant way. I mean that in the sense of. I'm just me, I'm being authentic. And it's hard some days being visible, but everyone's down for it and they're cool. And so I, I feel like that alone should give someone proof that they need that whoever you are, that people will value you for being authentic, you know? And, and, and it just, people can feel that vibration when you, when you show up for yourself, you know, and you emote and that there's just a, a, a radiance, a glow, you know, your eyes brighten and people can, you know, they just, they can feel it. So, I mean, I always tell people when, if we're talking specifically on a trans person, when they're scared to come out, it's like, well, look at my page, you know, like I'm doing it, you know, and, and pe I think there's like, I don't know, 27,000 people following me or something. You know, I'm happy if I reach one person. I don't care about the numbers, but I'm just saying, like, so there's at least 27,000 people that are not transphobic and, and just supporting. So I just feel like whoever you are, people will, you know, value the, 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 auth auth the authenticity of that. Um, and I mean, I'm trying to think what other, I guess the only thing I would want to say whatever you're going through. And this was something somebody said to me, the first person I ever told was, uh, I mean, I'll protect their, their identity because I know they don't want to be mentioned, but they're uh, another trans person and a, and a pretty well-known musician. And I reached out just not knowing, you know, how they would receive me. And I remember 
um, I kind of wrote them a paragraph of panic and they just wrote back, um, you're going to be okay. And like, man, I get goosebumps hearing it because they were right. You know, it's like, whatever you think it's going to be, whatever, like, you're going to be okay. You know, you've got, again, if it's a trans, non-binary, gay, whatever, you know, if your blood family doesn't, you know, accept you, love you, like there's so much chosen family. And that extends for whoever you are, that there's just chosen family that you find and that finds you by being you. And just even me being me as a guitar player, you know, being able to connect with you and Chucky and Jesse and Wendy Melvoin and Mike Scott and, you know, all these guitar players, Charlie Hunter, you know, people that I admire, like it just came through me being me and being authentic and someone seeing something in that, you know? Um, so yeah, I guess I would say you're gonna be okay. So by you being young as a kid, going through this alone, not talking for Sorry years. For my cat. No, it's okay. okay. For years, not talking. Um, would you advise that same kid or teenager or, uh, you know, middle-aged person, whoever is out there, would you advise them that's going through this, that's disturbing them mentally, would your advice be to speak to someone, talk about it? Um, oh, yeah, Reach yeah. out to you. Do, what, what is it? Because you held it in for so long, yeah. right? So, uh, again, only kind of wanting to speak on my own personal experience when I was ready to come out, I was very fortunate in that a good friend of mine was a gender therapist, coincidentally. So her, literally her job is to talk to individuals and help them, um, and I say help, not like guide them, to just understand what they're going through, whether they are trans or non-binary or neither. Um, she helps people understand if they're ready to transition or if their uh, if hormone replacement therapy is right for them. So I told her what was going on. She said, listen, I can't tell you who you are. And it's the same thing I would say to anybody. You know, I, I can't tell you who you are. You know, mm -hmm. I can share my life experience. And if that resonates with you, then you know, I, I hope that's comforting. So she said, I can't tell you who you are, but... I can tell you from listening to you that your story is eerily like mine and she's a trans woman. But the advice that she gave me was, uh, you know, to make a sort of a timeline, like in a journal, a gender timeline in terms of like, when were you feeling these things? You know, what was coming up and whatever. Again, I would say if somebody needs to make a timeline of the gender issues, I'd say they're probably trans because cis people just don't go their entire lives thinking those things. I mean, it's okay to, to have them cross your mind every now and not now and again, but this was like, this never left. And so I just was able to track things through movies. Oh, I remember this movie and feeling this, and, you know, I only identified with female characters and male clothes felt horrible and I felt sad and blah, 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 you know, so I could just write it all down. And, and once I started to write it down, I mean, there were just thousands and thousands of, I mean, it was just ridiculous. It was like, this is so obvious, you know? Um, so it was so clear and to someone else it, you know, it, it might not be, but, but journaling those things, um, you know, I mean, it's pretty, pretty stereotypical, but I did the like, yeah, I wore my mom's dresses when I was, three years old, five years old. I mean, it was just always, so. but I masked well, you know, I mean, nobody knew, I mean, nobody. Yeah. And some trans folks, it's not like that. Some it's just like, oh yeah, we saw that coming. You know, I just, I was like any dude, you know, I mean, nobody knew. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a testament, me looking the way I do, and to, this is just hormones. I haven't had any surgeries or anything that I'm just so comfortable being me, it's it's effortless. I don't I don't have to think about it, you know? Right. I mean, when I was living a different way, everything was a thought, you know, how does a man do this? Should I do this? Does that seem this, you know, can I do that? You know, it was exhausting. Wow. Um, so I, I just, 
sorry, it's my cat. Um, I just think it's sad that we have to be brave whoever we are. I think it's just, it's sad. And I know that people give me a compliment, like, oh, I'm inspired by your bravery. I know it's a compliment. I take it as a compliment. I don't take it for granted. But when I really sit with that statement, I shouldn't have to be brave to be who I am. Whoever you are, you, that shouldn't be an act of bravery and courage to be who you are by nature or whatever, you know. Um, and it just kind of saddens me that that needs to be like an act of bravery. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, Ella's just being her. Like, how courageous. It makes me sad, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wish that the world was a just a, a softer, gentler place to fall for, for a lot of us. You know. Listen, I want to let you go. I really, once again, I want to yeah. thank you so much. But I, before I let you go, I got one more question. You got yeah. four, you got four guitar players that you're gonna put on. You're gonna put on your Mount Rushmore. If you only get four, give me your four guitar players that you gonna put on top of Mount Rushmore. I mean, Spanky Alford, Wawa Watson. gonna be hard I mean Jimmy Nolan obviously I mean the last one oh Freddie Stone oh have you done a breakdown of thank you yet like really that really teach did, how you yeah. really you gotta send me that please because because I, did, I did two of them. I did two. One, one. I just was playing. Bruno was nice enough to give me his signature strat, and I played it. But I did another one um, where I did both parts. Where you know that Sly playing with his thumb, doing the wah wah part. Um, and then talk about like that's just one of the greatest guitar tones ever. I hesitated because I was like, do I want to list Sly? as the fourth guitar player because a lot of people don't know how funky he is and how he's playing guitar and a lot of that stuff too wow well uh, oh sly is so funky on everything but let me let me put let me add it let me add a a fifth we're gonna add a fifth oh. uh, head on 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 your mount Rush, rushmore and we we're we gonna put we're gonna put ella on there because when it comes down oh. to that listen when it comes down to that funk nobody does it better i'm telling you you got that thing down you got from the way that stuff's supposed to feel. When I hear you play, I'm like, oh my gosh, she's she's playing all the horn parts, she's playing the, the groove, the bass, she, you got that stuff like down to a science. I appreciate that, really. <laughs> so, so I, I, mean, I you, know, you know when you pick up the bass, you know what you wanna play and what makes you feel good. And when I pick up my instrument, that's just what makes me feel good. Listen. I'm gonna let you go. I have held you way too long, but man, you have an incredible. Oh, so fun, man! I, I, I just want to say thank you because you know uh, I admire you. Always admired you. I was telling you when we talked on the phone. I've always heard about you and Chucky when I was coming up. Like, yo, you need to listen to these cats, you know. Oh, wow. So I'm just honored that to be included in this, and and I appreciate you know you wanting to. Um, just kind of hear a little bit about the person behind the music because I, you know, I wonder how much of who we are as musicians is just simply because of who we are as people. And I don't, I, I don't know if it's fair to say, can you be a greater musician than you are a person? You know, I'm not saying I'm all that great, but I'm just saying, you know, it, it's our humanity that, that makes us, you know, the musicians we are. So I appreciate you just wanting to learn a little bit about me. Listen. I totally admire and respect you as a musician, but that doesn't compare to how much I admire you and respect you as a person. Thank you. And, and with that being said, I want everybody to please um, go follow her, go support her, check her out, y'all. She's really, really, she's really dope. On, on on at what she does and that's why you know the industry reaches out to her um thanks um myself included so 
I want everybody to please show your love. Show your love for this incredible, not just an incredible person, but incredible musician, um, artist, orchestrator, just, you know, funk, F-O-N-K. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, y'all y'all give it up for my dear, dear friend, Ella. Fine go. Give it up, y'all. Give it up to her. Give it up. <laughs> thank you so much thank for hanging so out much. with me. No, thank you. Much respect. Thank you. D-O-A-K. Let's get the funky.